I want to begin with a story of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sitting in a moment that we are very familiar with known as the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, Sulh Hudaybiyah. And there's a moment with the Prophet والسلام, in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah that is very famous where as he's negotiating this peace treaty the Prophet وسلم, is willing to accept certain conditions from Suhail ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu who would become Muslim later on because he knew it was for the benefit of the community and he saw the future Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was not a petty man and amongst those conditions was that you would have to erase off of this treaty Muhammad Rasulullah Muhammad the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we all know the story where Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu did not want to erase the name Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the Messenger of Allah from that treaty and the Prophet says, show, show me where it's at, and I'll erase it myself. Why? Because the Messenger وسلم, understood that even if Rasulullah was not written on that treaty, it was inscribed in the hearts of thousands of men and women and thousands and millions more to come that didn't need it to be on a piece of paper in order to live their lives in accordance with it. And he erased it Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not a petty man, a visionary man Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now there's another incident that takes place because as you see the multiple ambassadors that are entering in to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and try to negotiate this treaty. And one of the men that came forth was a man by the name of Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi radiallahu anhu, also became Muslim later on, just like Suhail ibn Amr. But Ur Urwa ibn Mas'ud was a proud man from Ta'if. And he had a certain presence to him. And he was the chosen ambassador to Caesar and Kisra and Najashi, to the rulers of the world because of his imposing presence. The Prophet ﷺ said, I saw Isa ibn Maryam السلام, Jesus peace be upon him. And he resembled Urwa ibn Mas'ud. That should tell you a lot about his appearance. So he comes into the gathering of the Prophet ﷺ and he knows the Prophet ﷺ from before. And a man by the name of Mughira ibn Shu'ba, who's from Thaqif, stands up behind the Prophet ﷺ and takes up the position of a guard. And as Urwa enters in, and Urwa has entered into the legions of the pompous rulers and tyrants of the world, he starts to address the Prophet ﷺ, and because he's still on that old way of thinking, he puts his hand out to grab the beard of the Prophet ﷺ, to belittle him. And when he does that, Mughira ibn Shu'ba, whose face was wrapped, he takes the bottom of his sword, the handle of his sword, and he knocks his hand off of the, the beard of the Prophet ﷺ. Urwa looks up at him, and he does it again. Mughira knocks his hand away again. He does it a third time. Mughira knocks his hand away again. He puts out his hand a fourth time. And he says to him, he knocks it away and he says, listen, if you want that hand to come back to you again, I suggest you don't put it out. I'm not going to do this a fifth time. And so he looks up and he says, you know, who do you think you are? And he says to the Prophet ﷺ, who is this man? And the Prophet ﷺ smiles at him and says, that's actually your nephew. <laughs> Mughira ibn Shu'ba ibn Abi Amr. Al-Thaqafi, Ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi, that's actually your nephew that's covered and that's standing up for the Prophet Sallallahu in that way. And Urwa responds back with a message like, you know, I used to change your diapers, I knew you when you were young, who do you think you are? 
But he leaves that gathering and he goes back to Quraysh. And this is before he's Muslim. And he says to them, Ya qawm, O my people, listen to me. I have entered upon the kings of the world. I have entered upon Kisra and Qaisar, Caesar and Najashi of Abyssinia. He says, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا رَأَيْتُ مَلِكًا قَتْ يُعَذِّمُهُ أَصْحَابُهُ مَا يُعَذِّمُ أَصْحَابُ مُحَمَّدٍ مُحَمَّدًا He said, I have never in my life seen a man who is more revered by his companions. No king, no man that is more revered, more loved by his companions than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is by his companions. If you read back into the 19th century, Reginald Bosworth Smith, he said that he was the Pope without the Pope's pretensions. And he was Caesar without his castles. He didn't have the military power or the supports or the appearance or the attention, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he didn't have the traditional structure of a person who in such a short period of time is able to command that large group of people and to change the landscape of the world. It wasn't typical Muhammad was different. And he said, if any man ever could claim that he ruled by divine right, it would have to be him. It's one of the greatest proofs of his prophethood. He didn't have the army of a prophet. He didn't have the supports of a prophet. He didn't have the wealth of a prophet. He didn't live the lifestyle of a king or a tyrant. He was different. When Zayd ibn al-Haritha, who was the adopted son of the Prophet, his father found him after looking for him for decades. Zayd was kidnapped as a child, sold into slavery, purchased by Hakim ibn Hizam, who was the cousin of Khadija radiallahu anha, gifted to Khadija radiallahu anha, gifted to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ took him in like a son. Hibbu Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa the beloved one of the Prophet ﷺ. He never felt less than anyone in the household of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He never felt belittled. And this is all before the Prophet Sallallahu receives revelation. And his father is going around the world trying to find him. And when he finally finds the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and realizes that Zayd is with him and calls for Zayd to come back to him, Zayd radiallahu anhu says, I'd rather stay with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says to him, Zayd, are you going to choose a life of slavery over a life of freedom? Because technically speaking, he came into this household through that means. Are you going to choose a stranger over your family, your people? Are you going to choose that life over the life that you would have in your own household? And he says, listen to me, my father. I've seen something from this man. He's different. He treats me better than a person would treat their own family, their own children. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ, with the permission of his father, actually adopted him officially as a son before Islam. But the Prophet ﷺ was different. You know the famous story of Umar bin Khattab anhu, where Umar anhu walks in to the room of the Messenger وسلم, and he rises from his bed and the Prophet وسلم, has marks on his back because the bed of the Prophet وسلم, and this is at the height of his power the bed of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, the most important man in the Ummah the most powerful man there is a bed of branches that leaves marks on his back and Umar who cries and the Prophet وسلم, says why are you crying O Umar? He said I've seen Caesar I've seen Kisra, I've seen what kings live like and you're so much more worthy than those kings are. And the Prophet ﷺ says to Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Ala tarda, ama tarda, aren't you pleased that for them is this material world and for us is the hereafter? With full confidence, he was different sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When you look around the world and throughout history at tyrants, tyrants are some of the most insecure people in the world. They know they're imposters and so they have to overcompensate for their own insecurities. 
with all sorts of things to demonstrate superiority. When you look at the Prophet wasallam, what caused people to revere him so much that he didn't need any of the traditional supports of a king to become the most influential and impactful man in the history of the world? What did the Prophet wasallam, exhibit of character that not a single person from his household defected without the threat of persecution were they to do so, but the children of his enemies almost unanimously within the course of a decade came to his side. Not one scandal in the house of the Prophet ﷺ. Not one child who defected and said, you don't know what he's really like on the inside. Not one person who could claim being mistreated. The most overexposed man in history in terms of his biography ﷺ and what do you see except for the moral high ground? You are on an exalted standard. You're different. You're different. You're different. When we talk about leadership and what it means to be a community of leadership, a great leader does not just put forth a shared vision that people can coalesce around. A great leader demonstrates the highest standards of that shared vision. And there was no one in the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ who at any point had any doubt that he was living to the standards that he was preaching and in fact demonstrating them in a way that the more that you would know about his private life, the more that you would be convinced in his public message. Why do I mention this about the Messenger ﷺ and how is this related to the topic of the day? When we talk about a balanced message, when we talk about kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas, you are the best nation that was produced for the people. When you are shuhada ala nas, you are a witness upon the people the way the Prophet ﷺ was a witness upon you. The way that you gain the respect of a society that is in search of a greater purpose is by demonstrating that in your actions in a way that is so self-evident that you don't need to overcompensate. And in fact, you can propel yourself ahead as a community without the other supports of power that others have to resort to. That by being always on the moral high ground and calling people to moral consistency, you can always at some point overcome those who are morally bankrupt even if they have all of the mechanics to suppress your message. That's our messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A prophet that could sleep under a tree. A prophet that could walk without a bodyguard. A prophet that could proudly come forth before his people and not have to talk about his greatness but demonstrate it with his humility. A prophet that called people to what was better for them in this life and the next and they knew it because he was always dedicated to their welfare in this life so why would he not be dedicated to their welfare in the next? When you're talking about a search and people searching for moral clarity, a world of moral inconsistency, I want you to go back to that message and I want you to go back to the Messenger وسلم, and ask yourself, why was he so effective? You could read every leadership book in the world and I guarantee you could connect it back to a tradition of the Prophet How was he able to wield all of that power and not exploit and abuse that power when he had it in a matter of two decades? Dear brothers and sisters, I want you to think about this for a moment. Two decades, which is the extent of the message of the Prophet wasallam, his seerah, is exactly the same time frame that we now have as a Muslim community from 9-11. Two decades since 9-11. The entire seerah of the Prophet wasallam, post receiving revelation is just two decades Look at the growth, look at the trajectory, look at the resilience, look at the moral clarity. And we have to ask ourselves at this point, at what point do we manifest that consistency and that courage and that morality 
to where what we preach has become self-evident in our community practice. I mentioned this earlier today, I'm speaking to a group. When the Prophet ﷺ entered into Medina and he gave his inaugural message, there naturally could be a lot of hesitation. You know, you hear every politician give you that opening message about what they want to accomplish in society. And almost consistently, they disappoint with their inconsistency and their failure to live up to that message. The Prophet ﷺ walks into Medina and I've only got a decade with you, 10 years with you. And in the midst of war and facing the threats of genocide and facing all sorts of internal turmoil and, and, and external turmoil, what am I going to tell you? Ayyuha nas afshu salam. O people, spread peace. Atimu ta'am. Feed the hungry amongst you and feed each other. And connect the ties of kinship. And pray at night while other people sleep and you will enter into Jannah in peace. And you know what? By the time the Prophet ﷺ was put into his grave in Al-Madinah Al-Munawwara, all that he had preached had come to be an experienced reality by his community. People are searching right now. People are looking for something that makes sense. People are looking for an example of consistency. And as a community, we cannot just quote the seerah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because Allah made him a shaheed over us so that we could be shuhada over the people. We have to live it in a way that it becomes so self-evident that it is indisputable that what we have is not like what other people have and that we're different in a good way. But the moral middle cannot be claimed except by those who maintain the moral high ground and do not succumb and do not compromise and do not become inconsistent. I leave you with this thought. Al-Hajj Malik al-Shabaz. Al-Hajj Malik al-Shabaz, Malcolm X, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. What they hated about him so much was that you couldn't soil him. With all the FBI records on him, 20,000 or so pages of documents, of his phone calls and his meetings and his travels, with all of the attempts to soil him, the only thing they could come out with was he's a morally upright man who neither smokes nor drinks and he's rarely late to an appointment. The man is like a saint. Their words while they were trying to delegitimize him. And that's why you see in a sincere person, subhanAllah, with all of the attempts to delegitimize, with all of the attempts to discredit, even when they assassinate him, those who disagreed with him still said he was one of the most sincere people that they had ever heard of or met. I want us, dear brothers and sisters, to recognize, and I have to end with this, inshallah ta'ala, that our character is our credibility. That was the case for the Prophet ﷺ as an individual. That is the case for us as leaders in our communities and with our families and with our neighbors and with our co-workers leading the way with a moral example. And that is the way for us, inshallah ta'ala, as a collective community. I pray that Allah allow us to live that beautiful example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, to where people find the Ark of Noah being his sunnah when they're drowning in all sorts of other things and that they see what his example has manufactured in us in hopes that they too would find the clarity that we seek on a daily basis by trying to be more like him. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.